Yeah, so I will talk about metalloenzymes. I will talk some theory about it, but I will give also some examples from my own research and metallo-dependent enzymes and engineering of these enzymes. And there are also a lot of examples from literature, which I will quickly go through. So you have an idea about working groups which work on metalloenzymes and especially also artificial metalloenzymes. Um, yeah, generally, so I was at the conference some years ago and there was a lot of discussion going on about the exact definition of a metallome. Like you have the proteome, you have the glycome, you have everything, you have also a metallome. And basically one of the easiest um, definitions is just it's the distribution of metal ions in a certain organism. And there are, of course, some metals which are more abundant and some metals which are only there in trace amounts. And they have many functions. So they work as ele electrolytes, but they are also in the structure of, of bones, teeth. And of course, for us, interesting in many enzymes are dependent on metals. And they are also involved in the, in the stability of, of nucleic acids and yeah, they are also used a lot um, in medicine. And in chemistry, metals also play an important role. So especially transition metal catalysis is quite common. But I will now, of course, they have advantages. But now I will more list some disadvantages and why in some cases uh, metalloenzymes might be more um, convenient to use. Um, so there are. Some metals are really expensive, and when they are embedded in proteins, they are easier to recycle. Other metals are really toxic, and um, yeah, it, catalyst re recovery is quite challenging in chemistry. And when it's bound to proteins, it's easier. Um, sometimes you need special ligands to get stereo selectivity, and the protein itself already gives a stereo selective um, environment. And quite often you need harsh reaction conditions in metallochemistry. And yeah, now more and more also in chemistry, um, ligands are found which are um, inexpensive and also um, more bio-relevant. But still um, there is a lot, of, a, a lot of research going on both um, in chemistry to find new ligands, but also now in, in metalloprotein research. And so in nature, actually, one third of the proteins are metalloproteins. And they contain the metal either as isolated ions directly bound to the, to the amino acids, or it's coordinated in some organic compound, for example, like a porphyrin ring. And so the metals there have different configurations, different oxidation numbers. They are coordinated in different ways in the protein. And the role of the metal in the protein is again, in many cases, stabilization. So not every metalloprotein is an enzyme, but they are also quite often directly involved in the reaction. So in the reaction mechanism and also in substrate binding. And here you just see an overview of different systems where metalloproteins play a role. So of course there are the enzymes, but they also play a role in, in transport, in signal transduction, in respiration, DNA synthesis, photosynthesis. There are many, many functions. And in many cases also diseases have, um, the reason for some diseases is actually also metal imbalance or inactive metalloproteins. And concerning metal binding sites, so they are defined via the structure and via the sequence, and there are programs available to detect them. And so most frequently there are histidine, cysteine, glutamate, and aspartate binding the amino acids, but uh, the metal, but there are also other amino acids sometimes involved in metal binding. And yeah, some metals are mainly bound to oxygen, but transition metals are bound to sulfur and nitrogen as well. And yeah, there is a metal PDP database where you can look for metal proteins and their structures and data, which is 
um, related to the metal, so you can see the um, coordination of the metal to the protein, the um, yeah, different information that is collected from the PDP. But there is one thing um, which you have to be aware of. It doesn't always mean that the metal is correct, which is in the PDP, because um, I also experienced that. Um, I don't know why in one paper the author said they have manganese bound um, to the protein, but they didn't have any proof. But what they did is they expressed the protein in normal LP medium, which contains quite a lot of iron and zinc. They didn't add any manganese, they didn't add any metal, and then they did a nickel purification. And we also worked with this protein and we saw when we did the nickel purification, um, we saw that we got a lot of nickel bound. So after we sent this sample to the um, metal analysis, what we found was iron, zinc and nickel. There was no manganese. The manganese was only there if we edited it and did not do nickel purification. So you have to be very careful. And also if you see a structure in the PDP, and it doesn't have a metal, it also, it could have lost it. So if you see there is something that could be a metal binding site, just because it's not deposited in the PDP, it doesn't mean that it doesn't have a metal. Yeah. And yeah, so production of metalloproteins, I could give a whole lecture just about that. I just put um, a very few things, what you have to consider, where, how you put the metal in the protein. So there's always the thinking, should I add the metal already or incorporate the metal already in vivo or is it better to do it in vitro? And when you do it in vivo, that means in whatever expression host you choose, you have to think um, which metals um, the organism can stand and in which concentration. So there are normal metals like iron, zinc, manganese that are usually not a problem but when you start working with copper and, and nickel and things like that, or even more challenging enzymes, in some cases it might be even difficult to find literature about it. Um, so you have to think of, yeah, is that metal suitable for my expression host at all? And if, in what concentrations can I use the metal? Is the metal concentration in the cell high enough for a highly expressed protein? Because, for example, in our case, the cupins I will talk about later on, they are highly expressed. So there is more than 50% of the whole protein is, is um, cupin if we use a high expression vector system. And then the metal content, manganese content, for example, in the cell is never high enough to have a full uh, metal loading. And we had to reduce the expression to get a good metal loading. Yeah, the expression medium, of course, do you need to use some minimal medium and leave out all the metals that you don't need? Or is it not crucial? You can use LP medium. If you know that the metal you want to use later on can replace like iron and zinc just because it has a higher affinity. And yeah, the purification. For metal proteins, you really need to think if, if affinity chromatography using nickel is a good method. Of course, if you want to use nickel afterwards and leave your tag, it's a perfect purification method. But if you want, if you're interested in some other metal, that's something you should think of that you might use some other chromatography. Also, when you use iron chromatography, you have to think maybe not um, cation chromatography. Also, buffers, additives, quite often EDTA is just used as a additive also to buffers when you lyse your cells and stuff like that. But you have to consider when you use metal proteins, you might chelate your metal out of the protein. Is the upper protein stable? So can you purify protein without metal at all? In some cases when the metal is really important for the structure, um, you, need, you always need to have some metal there because the upper protein will be very instable. Yeah, and the metal loading, um, afterwards is always what is the purpose where you need it for. Do I really need to know exactly the amount? That means you need, really need to purify your protein, then do a metal exchange, quantify the metal content with some method. Or do you just want to check if it does the reaction at all, then you just add um, the metal during expression or to your lysate and use the whole stuff. But yeah, there are so many things that you need to consider and it's a case-to-case um, thing that I 
don't go too much into detail um, there. Just a few comments also about metal analysis because um, of course if you want to get really nice kinetic data and you really want to say I have that um, um, this activity for that amount of enzyme you want to know really the amount of active enzyme which means actually the amount of enzyme with metal bound because it could be that you have only 30, 20, 50 percent metal loading and then your unit activity will be actually always be a bit wrong. And so there are methods for metal analysis like nowadays quite frequently used because available at most universities at least is ICT, OES or mass spectrometry where the samples are usually liquefied so you can use protein samples but you could use any thing you can also use immobilized protein on beads because the sample will be, will be dissolved in acid and by, with microwave treatment and then it will be um, sprayed into the plasma and so usually every um, element has a certain wavelength or certain um, pattern of, of, of um, how it's emitting the light and you can analyze this with a spectrophotometer that, that is, this is then the OES but um, you can also generate ions and separate them by mass and so that's then the, OES, um, the MS and MS um, is much more sensitive than the OES and you will need less samples because overall when you use proteins for ICT OAS you will need a few milligrams of proteins which of course are lost because they are completely degraded and for the MS you just need a few micrograms. Mm, yeah then of course there are some older methods like atomic absorption spectroscopy which also needs quite some samples. Um, with EPR you can analyze um, metals which are paramagnetic um, and some of quite a few of the transition metals are paramagnetic and then you can also analyze um, changes in the environment so you can record one spectrum um, with the metal bound and then you can add the um, different substrates and you will see changes in the spectrum when, when the, um, met, uh, the substrate binds and also when you have change amino acids you see different um, patterns of, of EPR spectra and then you see which, met, uh, which proteins really interact um, with your metal if that's not clear for example also if you don't have a structure available I'm, I'm not sure about that. Um, yeah there are some methods which you can only do at the synchrotron which require x-ray um, so there are different methods I basically only list them here for completeness because usually we don't have that easy access all the time and also to beams that can do that although they are available now at all synchrotrons already. Um, there you can also in some cases just say which metal but in other you can also see redox changes and yeah more um, information about the geometry of the metal complex. And also general in X-ray crystallography you can use um, the metals and for example also heavy metals um, to solve um, the phase problem and so you can also soak your crystals with heavy metal ions um, to get maybe your structure solved. So that was just some um, instrumental work but that's always you need equipment and in many cases you need quite some sample um, for, he, for some quick and high throughput but maybe not so quantitative there are uh, also some um, methods available which um, just work in a normal plate reader for example luminol I mean most of you heard about luminol when you watch CSI or so they always use luminol to detect blood and to see where where the murder happened and stuff like that but it's not only um, um, uh, giving the signal with iron but also with with other metals and so basically you need luminol and um, um, H2O2 some base and a catalyst and the catalyst can be many different um, 
transition metals, and I've read also some of the other rare metals um, work with luminol. And there is another dye which um, gives colored complexes with certain metals. And interestingly, it quenches also some of the um, luminol chemiluminescence. And there, one group developed an assay where basically it's a three step assay um, where you have first a luminol assay, and you can say, decide yes, it's fluorescing or no. Then you add the tar. Then in some cases, the luminol signal will disappear. Then you know it is this metal. If it's not disappearing, and after a certain time, you get the colored complex, and you get an another signal. For example, you know it's cobalt. If then it doesn't stain, you will have iron and things like that. That works um, in combination with some metals, but in some cases you need to have um, you need to know that you have quite pure sample because the sample so if you have a no here and a yes here the no here will be quenched by the yes here so it's not that straightforward but still you get some sort of idea which metal you have and also you can have a standard curve and with that you also have some idea about quantification but of course it's not absolute values like you get for the ICT OES for example but it's quite good if you have many samples and you just quickly want to know, do I have metal there? Yes, no, then you can run this essay in, yeah, I mean, a plate reader which can do chemiluminescence, so it's not for every plate reader, but for many. Yeah. So <clears throat> now I'm just going to show you a few examples from my own research, or research which was going on in Graz in the last few years. <coughs> so, yeah, these were people involved in the project. So there were several diploma students, technicians, uh, one PhD student, and yeah, ICT um, analysis is always done at Geo Graz and structural biology we have at Uni Graz and also chemistry. And yeah, so in general, I was working for several years now with um, proteins that belong to the cupin superfamily of proteins. And the interesting thing about that, so there are hundreds, thousands of sequences and many, I mean now maybe more than 800 structures because this slide is a few years old now um, in the PDP, but many are, only very few are annotated. And so in one project, which is finished already, we were looking for novel functionalities in already published PDP data where there was just a PDP there without any annotation because these proteins crystallize quite easily. And so there are some functionalities already known, like there are many deoxygenases in this family, isomerases, epimerases. And, but yeah, there are many, many that where we really have no clue and so the thing about them is they are very highly expressed in E. coli, so you really get more than 50% protein, and you can mutagen mutagenize them easily, and they are generally very, very stable. And many of them are uh, metal proteins, not all of them, and the met if they are metal proteins, the metal um, binding sites are uh, part of a common motif, and the most common metals found are iron, but also uh, manganese, nickel, cobalt, zinc. And about this cadmium thing, that's another thing where I'm not so sure if that's really possible, but yeah. And yeah, the metal sites vary. So there are different amino acids involved. You have metal binding sites with three amino acids, with four amino acids, like you can see here. Sometimes you have up to four histidines, but only three histidines, one glutamate, and all the variations are possible. And so you also have different geometries um, of the metal. <coughs> and um, now I will give you two very concrete examples of what cupins can do. And um, one is, um, so it was discovered, I will show later, that one cupin is also hydroxynitrolyl. And hydroxynitrolysis, I mean, you know it already from talks also within Biocascade, 
um, in nature, they leave cyanohydrins and into aldehydes and HCN, and they are meant to be um, as this defense mechanism against bacteria and some other small animals. And usually they were always found in plants. And only a few years ago, we discovered them in bacteria. And two years ago, it was also published um, in anthropods. So that's the little worm that Professor Asano discovered. And yeah, they are an example for convergent evolution because you can see here, they belong to very different fold families. Some are cofactor dependent, some are not. Some are selective, some are aselective. So a lot of differences, but still they all have one thing in common. They catalyze the HCM, uh, H and L reaction. And we are now especially interested in the ones with the coupin fold. Mm, and yeah, so some years ago, that was a PhD thesis in the group of Professor Schwab. Um, a PhD student was screening um, libraries of gene libraries of, of endophytes. And yeah, he discovered that one of the proteins showed some weak HNL activity. And then um, more of these enzymes were found. So we screened databases and cloned several HNLs and then screened for activity. And yeah, we found that quite a few of the coupins, but with a certain motif, of course, um, catalyzed the HNL activity. And so this enzyme was characterized more, the most active enzyme was characterized in more detail. So we got the structure so because that was not in the PDP yet. And we also found out that it is metal dependent. Um, so we investigated the influence of the metal by removing it by um, site-directed mutagenesis of the metal binding amino acids. Um, so we removed the metal always with 2,6-pyridine decarboxylic acid. It's a stronger chelator like um, than EDTA. Um, it depends really on the protein because for this coupin, for example, EDTA is not enough, but for another coupin, EDTA is already enough to remove the metal. But in this case, um, we needed a stronger chelator and we exchanged it first. So in the paper, which is published to iron, mangan, and zinc, but also later on to other metals, analyzed it and we could see that we get a nice loading of the respective um, metal that we were adding. And we also could show that, <clears throat> so the APO enzyme, there are still some traces left of iron. So there is a little bit of, of conversion, but the EE is really bad. And um, anyway, HNLs always have, uh, the HCN reaction always has a certain background and um, the HNL is working against it. But the tray, uh, so this should, it does not really contain much um, metal, but a little bit of iron is already enough to at least give a bit of, of a product with some enantial selectivity. But what is very clear is with manganese, um, especially over time, we get a nice conversion and also quite nice EE values. We think it looks like the APO enzyme, maybe the um, EE is a bit, little bit um, better, so maybe it is very, very weakly active, but it's very difficult to say because overall the wild type enzyme is not so very active. And also with iron, um, we could see that we get values similar to manganese. <coughs> and we also mutated um, the metal binding amino acid. Um, so these four are the four that are always or basically are in the motif of, of coupins. And there is another uh, histidine close by, which is not a conserved residue ac according to the metal binding sites in, in coupins. But what we could see is um, that um, one of the variants um, was still active, one of the four variants. Also this, uh, so this is inactive when it's, um, it's not on this sheet. Here, um, when a uh, amino acid is removed, but and we could see that there is a correlation for these four amino acids between activity and that the metal is still bound. So one of the amino acids 
um, the one here, you can remove, you will not lose metal binding and it's still active. And there is one where the metal, metal binding is impaired and on this assay you don't see the activity anymore. And interestingly, it's not on this slide, so here, this residue here still can bind the metal, but it's completely inactive. So we were more thinking it could be some um, acti uh, somehow else um, responsible for activity. Yeah. Uh, and um, yeah, I, as I already said, for an HNL, it was really not a good enzyme compared to other HNLs known from literature. But because it can be expressed in E. coli, because of its high stability, it looked like a really interesting enzyme to really for industrial applications. And so we were um, starting to optimize it and did some um, engineering, especially for improved activity and broadened substrate scope. We also thought of um, doing it uh, towards stability in acidic uh, environment, but then we figured out that actually the problem is that um, at low pH, um, we are losing the metal and it's not, so the protein is stable, but we are losing the metal, which was not so surprising. And yeah, so we did some random mutagenesis and we also did some um, state saturation mutagenesis of the eight active site positions. And for the random mutagenesis, we did the whole gene and we also did parts of the gene without the metal binding site. And um, yeah, for the screening, um, HNL engineering is, is quite a nice thing to do because there is a really nice assay available. So we would spread all the variants on a big agarose uh, agar plate. And then ha we have a picking robot which would pick them, the variants in the 384 well um, plate. And then the cells are stamped on membranes. And those membranes are used for screening. And the screening is basically a filter assay where you have um, a, a filter paper with your um, substrate solution at the bottom. Then you put um, your colonies on top. And then you put sort of a nylon tissue with, with um, holes on top. And again, um, the detection filter on top. And the nylon is just there so that the detection uh, filter is not getting wet. And the HCN, which is released, uh, will give blue stains on the um, detection filter. And you see that easily, you can watch that over time and which is the most intense um, signal. You will see it on the next page. Then we did some rescreening and J plus fermentation and then um, HPLC analysis of the cyanogenesis reaction. And so here you see a colony filter assay. You place your controls here. So it's always a positive, negative, positive, negative. So controls here. And then you compare the time and the, intent, the time of appearance and the intensity of the spot um, over time to the whatever reference you have here. So the reference could be your wild type or your um, uh, parent variant, whatever you chose. And you can see here, there is one candidate where the spot looks really stronger and those would, would be cho chosen for rescreening. And yeah, for the random screening, we got some hits which were rescreened and then also tested um, on a larger scale. And you could see that some of the variants, many of the variants in fact were really more active than the wild type. And a few were, um, very, very few were, were actually false positive hits. <coughs> and we also did um, cyanohydrin synthesis. And you could see that the three most active variants were also more active in the synthesis of cyanohydrin. But um, yeah, still there is a little bit room for improvement, especially because we used quite a lot of enzymes. And the good thing is um, for the um, site saturation library, we got even better hits. So three positions seem to be interesting. And there we got already, um, so before we had always activities below one, so 0. point something 
units and here we already have five times increase of sensitivity. And also in the synthesis of Mandelo night trial, we could see that, yeah, we get full conversion. In some cases, the EE is not improved. In some cases, on the other hand, um, we have a nice EE and also a good improvement and all the variants were then combined. And this resulted in a double variant, uh, which gave more or less full conversion and excellent EEs. And also the specific activity got up to over 100, which is now in the range of normal HNLs, which you would see in literature. And yeah, it went up from 0 0.9 units per milligram to 140 almost units per milligram of protein. And also we could reduce um, the amount of enzyme which we use in the um, synthesis reaction significantly. Mm. And also we tested some um, substrates which were, are interesting for industrial applications. And in many cases, again, we got really nice conversions and high EE values. Yeah. And we were also able to solve the structure. And while um, the overall structure does not show any change. And also the side chains are exactly in the same position. You just see that, of course, you have a different side chain, but the cupin structure is very rigid. And that's why um, the overall structure is not changed at all by the three amino acid exchanges. And what we could see is <coughs> a change, of course, in the size of the binding pocket because it's getting smaller because now we have larger amino acids there. And the thing was we never were able to um, get any co-crystals for the wild type or also docking was, was in always inconclusive because there is so much space where, where the um, ligands can go. And now in the smaller binding pocket with the more charged amino acids, we were also able to get some docking results how, how the um, ligands might interact with the metal and the um, amino acids. And it seems that there is some hydrogen network between the histidines and the metal. But again, we did not get um, any co-crystals, so we don't have um, a really absolute idea about the reaction mechanism. And yeah, our crystallographers are always very careful about stating something. <laughs> and so I will also make really state something. Um, yeah, and the Henry reaction is also an interesting reaction, which is catalyzed by some HNLs in literature. And it's another CC bond forming reaction, um, which is, um, so results in beta nitro alcohol. And so there are a few selective chemical methods available. And it's interesting because there are a lot of follow-up reactions and follow-up products which are interesting like ephedrine or noephedrine or also chloramphenicol. And many chemical reactions have some side effects. So many are not selective, many need extreme reaction conditions or toxic reaction conditions. Interestingly, there are quite a few enzymes known that catalyze the reaction, but not selectively. But you can get full conversion with some of these enzymes, but completely without selectivity. And there are, so far, until we found our enzyme, only hydroxynitrolysis with alpha-beta hydrolase fold um, could catalyze the reaction. And so two are S-selective, and the third one, the R-selective one, is very instable. Um, there is a lot of work also going on, or did go on, for stabilizing it, but at that point, it was the only uh, R-selective enzyme, with, but with problems with stability. Um, so we took all our cupins, cupin HNL, and screened them for activity. And we got quite a <coughs> fit, um, yeah, widespread picture. So some were um, almost, sorry. So again, also for the Henry reaction, also without protein, you get some reaction which is unselective and the enzyme will work against it, the unselectivity. And we have some which are hardly above background, but some clearly are uh, more active than the background. And especially some shows some really nice um, enantioselectivity, which is not there 
when you don't have an enzyme. And interestingly, um, so the enzyme we were mainly focusing on until then was the PHNL, which was almost inactive um, in this reaction. But the little that was active showed some enantioselectivity. But when we used um, the variant, so the triple variant, we already could get that quite some nice um, activity and also a good PE value. And again, we could show that the reaction is metal dependent. And in this case, it seems to be um, less strict with the metal because only with zinc we got, and maybe nickel, we got significantly less um, um, conversion. And in that case, we thought we use less proteins and do a um, shorter reaction time so we can see differences. Because if we go to full conversion, we don't know if one metal is faster or slower. But yeah, what we could see is um, in the upper protein, we have some traces of manganese, which we could not remove. There is a little bit of conversion, but in all cases, basically we have more conversion than in the upper protein. So it seems that this reaction is not really, does not, it, it needs a metal, but it doesn't really matter which one. And then we were thinking maybe one of the other variants, which we already have, um, in our collection is more active than the triple variant. And actually we figured out that it is one position, position A48, which seemed to be responsible for the increased activity in the Henry reaction, because there after four hours already, we got um, over 70% um, conversion and a very excellent PE. And yeah. It doesn't matter if you use um, free enzyme or cell-free lysate um, because the background is about the same. The protein is stable when it's purified, but also you don't need to purify it. That's also a good thing to know. And also longer incubation times did not change the EE too much because with HNLs, when they get inactivated, the EE drops because then the background reaction will take over over time. And yeah, that seems that um, we don't have any problem with stability, but we did not expect it anyway. And yeah, so we all again could show that we can convert several um, aldehydes, also cyclic ones or aliphatic ones. And yeah, what is also really interesting when you think of later on follow-up products like noephedrine or ephedrine, um, we could also use nitroethane as nitroalkane instead of the nitromethane. And um, here we have four diastereomers. And the problem is, um, yes, we get really nice R selectivity on this position. But uh, we always have a mixture of the two products here. And <clears throat> so we are interested in especially this product here. And in the best case, we get 70%. So with the best variant, we get 70%, but only after uh, with very um, low yield, unfortunately. And again, the same, we tested the same aldehydes. They can all be converted as well with nitroethane. And subsequently, we were interested in improving this, uh, on the one hand, the activity with nitroethane but also improving the diastereoselectivity. And we did a similar um, assay, but in this case, we did not have the nice um, filter assay where we just detect the, the HCN, but we had an assay in a micro titer plate where we first needed to grow the cells in deeper plates, and then we lysed the cells and did an um, assay um, in a micro titer plate. Um, there we, we were thinking a lot how we can detect all the different products and did not come to any solution at that point. And so we decided that we would just um, detect the decrease of the benzaldehyde. So if an enzyme is faster, you will have used up more benzaldehyde, but unfortunately it does not give you any idea about CS or enantioselectivity. But yeah, at that point we said, okay, fine. We anyway want also a faster enzyme, so we, we will just um, choose all the faster enzymes and then um, characterize the hits on HDLT to see about enantio and CS stereo selectivity. And so this is the pattern of one of the plates where you can see one of the variants, which was a hit. 
Um, so it's a negative thing because the, it's the use up of the benzaldehyde. So the lower the signal, the more benzaldehyde is used up. So the lowest signal is always the best. And yeah, so we had several hits and it always came up with the same position, which is not published. So you will not get to know the position. <laughs> and yeah. We did also site saturation mutagenesis then at this position and it was confirmed that quite some of the variants at this position were more active. And the thing was, unfortunately, we got the opposite on what we wanted because exactly our product, our product that we wanted was um, reduced. So we sort of improved the diastereo selectivity, but in the wrong way. And yeah, so this is a classical example. You get what we screen for because we thought, okay, fine. Now we go for activity, it's enough. And maybe we are lucky, but we were not. <laughs> and yeah, now we have some other strategies how to um, go for diastereo selectivity. We will see. Yeah, so the conclusion of this part, yeah, that we have found basically the first bacterial nitro aldolases. And yeah, which is also the first, which is not the alpha beta hydrolase type. And it's the most stable and most productive r selective enzymes and it can produce in high yield. And that's why it was also um, patented. And yeah, we will see what, what comes out in some years maybe. Yeah, so I don't know. So I have one and a half hours, or right? <laughs> I mean, I have more slides anyway. Um, yeah, so just another example of cupins. Um, so it's um, a protein which has um, oxidative activities. And so some years ago, um, we were thinking um, that maybe some of the cupins that we have um, have some oxidative activities. So we made a selection of a few cupins that we would be testing and we tested th them with um, different substrates so that that's just exemplifying different the different groups that we used and we used them with with um, with just with oxygen or different peroxides and already the first one that we tested um, got some reaction with styranes and their sure is due to hydroperoxide and so we decided to um, characterize it further the interesting thing was it did not give any like hydroxylation th um, things that we were expecting or epoxidation or so, but it um, catalyzed alkene cleavage. And alkene cleavage is also important to functionalize um, alkanes and you get aldehydes and ketones, which are interesting for flavor and fragrance industry, especially, but also for pharmaceutical industry. And again, there are chemical methods like ozonolysis, but it's quite um, harsh conditions and it's also explosive and um, it can be done with heavy metals, which are toxic. And of course, there is an attractive alternative, which are enzymes. There was en one enzyme known before by Wolfgang Rutil, which can do the reaction quite nicely. There are some other peroxidases which have this as side reaction, but um, that was one of the enzymes which does it quite uh, good because it gives um, quite nice conversion. So, uh, but again, not at the beginning. What we started out with again, um, that was actually the enzyme where it was stated in the paper that it is manganese that is bound in the structure, what then we could not confirm when we did exactly what they did. But in fact, it is manganese dependent. What we figured out then by adding different other metals also here is only shown manganese and iron. And here is manganese two and manganese three. And it seems to be manganese three that is responsible for the reaction. And then it's going to manganese two, but we don't have really the proof for that. Because yeah, we were running out of, 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 of C18 um, oxy, uh, of, oh, of, oxy, of marked oxygen. Anyway, um, we improved the reaction conditions because um, the enzyme comes from a um, highly thermostable um, organism. 
we were thinking, oh, we can work with very high um, reaction conditions because it's known that enzymes from this organism um, work at high reaction temperatures. But the problem is the substrate um, polymerizes at higher temperatures and also the peroxide is somehow destroyed. So in the end, we ended up with 30 degrees. And there we then tested the pH optimum, which seemed to be in the neutral to basic pH. And yeah, it seems that we need some molar excess of the peroxide. And also we changed to a biphasic system because we wanted to use higher substrate concentrations. And in general, we got higher conversions in the biphasic system, most likely due to also the um, solubility. Yeah, and so this is the substrate scope, um, which the enzyme can use. Unfortunately, we tested many other substrates and you already saw some of them on the first slide of this part. Um, we can only um, cleave alkanes um, next to the aromatic ring. So <clears throat> it doesn't work if it's further away or if there is no aromatic ring nearby. And what we could see is in very rare cases, we could see um, epoxids. And what you would also expect, especially for the aldehydes or only for the aldehydes, that you might um, see also traces of, of the acid. But this was only the case in the uh, excess system. In the biphasic system, we did not have any um, acid form. And yeah, again, we wanted to increase the activity. And in this case, um, we did site saturation mutagenesis of the all um, active sites. Amino acids, again, there was no quick filter as available, but we had to do it in the micro titer plates. So first, we were growing the variants in deeper plates. And then we used um, vanillin to detect um, the ketone, which is formed. So we used. Um, You see, we used here this substrate um, where we can get the ketone. We could have also used um, one to get an aldehyde, but it was more stable in the assay to use an assay. We were trying different assays, so we were trying to detect the aldehyde also. Um, but the, in the end, we decided we go for the ketone because the color formation was more reliable and more stable. So yeah, we decided to go for the acetophenone as product and use substrates which result in acetophenone as, as product. And we will get a color complex. And again, you could um, run a dilutions of acetophenone to get the standard curve or simply compare it to, to the wild type or the whatever parent variant you choose. And again, we were expressing it with shake flask and afterwards checked um, the conversion in, on CT, in CTMS. Um, and what we could see here, so that's all the active site amino acids. Um, that's especially this position here, so C106, which is actually an interaction with one of the metal binding histidines, um, is the variant um, which seemed to be most relevant because um, many of the exchanges at this position resulted in um, higher activity. And from the, I think, 20% we had at the beginning or 30% conversion, we doubled to the 60% uh, conversion. <coughs> and you can see here, this is um, the relative conversion um, compared to wild type. And yeah, two variants at this position really show double conversion, but there were also other interesting variants. But the combination of the different variants um, did not give a better conversion than the one already at position uh, C106, a single variant. What we also could see that um, when the T-terminus was removed by accident, because we had a stop codon in one of the uh, last of amino acids, um, that also improved the activity because the active site was even more open. Yeah. And so that's just what we are doing now. It's unpublished, but anyway, the results are without 
indication which amino acids it is. So we also did then some random engineering sort um, activity and we figured that um, the peroxide is um, denaturing our protein after, over time. And so we were also exchanging some of these amino acids and we got two variants. So this is the variant with the oxidized amino acid exchange. And that's the variant from, um, from the random engineering. And for both, the starting um, variant was the C106Q. And in both cases, we got some nice um, improvement. But again, combining the two did not result in an even further improved activity. But basically, with one of the variants, now we get um, overnight. So this is after a few hours, and that's overnight, the yellow one we get full conversion overnight and the reaction is still going on. So it's when we then add another round of, of substrate, it starts again. So we could also show it's still active and not in, inactivated by oxidative conditions. Yeah. And now that we have a stable enzyme available, we wanted to go for um, substrate scope. So really for industrially relevant substrate. But that was the step which we needed to go first because we figured always after some time the protein is dead and that's why we thought first to tackle the stability issues before we really go for substrate scope. Yeah, and we were actually one, the, prote the project which is currently running here in the house is also to use um, less frequent um, ions and test for new reactions. Unfortunately, someone else was faster in publishing some exchange to osmium in the same enzyme we were working on. And they used um, some osmium complex and bound it um, to the protein. They confirmed it by X-ray crystallography that it's actually really bound in the active site. And the, they could show peroxygenase activity, but um, they did not have any enantioselectivity. Uh, in contrast to our reaction, which seems to work better in um, neutral and slightly um, basic conditions, um, low pH seemed to be good for this reaction. The thing is, they didn't show the manganese enzyme. So it could be that our manganese enzyme anyway does the reaction also. But we did not have time yet to test it because the paper came out just a month ago. And yeah, they could um, cleave, uh, not cleave, but um, yeah, use um, not just styrenes, but they could also use um, alkanes without any aromatic ring. So they also could use alkane derivatives. And again, also they did the mutagenesis and also they found that the same position that we figured out um, is resulting in more active proteins. And yeah. I mean, the thing was, we also expected sort of hydroxylation when we did the first screening and not alkane cleavage. But I mean, we did it at neutral pH. So we don't know yet if actually the protein with manganese can do the reaction as well. And on the other hand, they didn't test it either. So yeah. But yeah, speaking of artificial metalloprotein, this is the last part now. Um, artificial metalloproteins are getting more and more um, interesting at the moment on the lab scale, not yet on, for industrial application, but artificial metalloproteins are thought um, that you can combine basically metal catalysis from chemistry um, with the enantioselective environment of the protein and thereby having the advantages of both worlds, so to say. And the thing is, I mean, metal catalysis, there is a vast amount of reactions. It's even difficult to choose which reaction you could imagine. There are so many metals used in chemistry, and many of them are not used uh, in enzymes. But on the other hand, some of the most common uh, metals which are found in enzymes are also used in chemistry. So there is some overlap. <coughs> and when you have um, artificial metalloproteins, there are three key parameters that you have to consider. So one is, of course, the metal, um, which is used. Um, one is the protein scaffold, where you put the metal. 
and one is the mode how you would put the metal into your protein scaffold. And yeah, the metal, there are many things you have to consider. Of course, this shouldn't be toxic because um, biocatalysis and also working with enzymes sort of has the idea to have a greener process, so you shouldn't maybe use the most toxic metals then. Of course, they should be cheap. As enzymes like to work in water, it, it would be good if also the metals are stable in water. And when I say the reactive form should be stable, so in, in many cases, for example, iron 2 is quite sensitive to oxidation and it's, it's not really applicable if you then, when you have the metal in your protein, always have to work under inert gas. That will not be very applicable when you think of, of a larger scale. <coughs> And the protein scaffold, so there are some general features. Of course, it should be easily expressed in a standard expression host. It should be stable as purified protein in various reaction conditions. It should be tolerating amino acid exchanges. So basically things that you always expect of a good protein, which should be applied um, in biocatalysis. But there are some specific features um, which depend largely on the strategy that you choose for the artificial metalloprotein design. Like if you want to use a metal binding site which is already present, um, which amino acids are there close by, is there a cavity where you could introduce a metal binding site for example, the size and the shape of course of the active site and, and lots of things that, that you have to decide on when you once you have chosen your strategy. And yeah, there are three different modes of attachment basically. So on one hand, it's um, for example, just a general interaction of some like biotin of something that is carrying the metal, so to say, with the protein and the metal is then bound to this carrier. Or you have the metal itself interacting um, with different amino acids, which are already there, but there is not really, it's interaction and there is no binding. Or you can have it really um, chemically modified, some amino acids, so you have a real binding of, of your metal complex there. And there are examples for all these strategies. And I will give you, yeah, I mean, it will be quite a lot because nowadays there are really, quite a few groups working on it and there are really lots of different um, strategies and I will just yeah, introduce every strategy with a few words and pictures, but if you are interested, you have then to look up for the working groups and the papers which you find there because it would be too much. <coughs> yeah, so the easiest thing of course is use a, existing metalloprotein and exchange the metals or the metal cofactors. Um, like we did, for example, here, that's the cupin. So we add the chelator, the metal is removed, and then we incubate it with different metals and remove the excess metal. And we have a new metal protein basically there. And yeah, you can exchange the cofactor to some artificial cofactors also. You can look for promiscuous activities and you can alter the active site um, by mutagenesis, of course, without changing the metal and you can also look for, for non-natural reactions there. And yeah, for example, promiscuous reactivities are also observed in the cupin structure. So also Professor Nedetsky here in Graz or Fritz Ragant was postdoc there at some time ago. Um, she worked on uh, T-ketones leaving deoxygenases and figured out there is also oxygenase activity. Um, if iron is present, but when um, uh, the iron is exchanged to zinc, there is also hydrolysis of activated esters. As you can see here again, the cupin poles, and in this case, it's only a three histidine metal binding site compared to other and so that's the easiest thing, but it's already sort of artificial because it's not the natural thing, although you never know what the natural thing of um, metal protein is if you don't know the original host or the 
exact environment. If you don't purify it from the original host in the original environment, you never know what would have been the original network. Yeah, and then there is the carbonic anhydrase. That's one of the most famous examples, which is around for quite some time. So it is a zinc dependent enzyme, again, with three metal binding histidine. And um, it catalyzes the hydration of carbon dioxide, but it has um, promiscuous esterase activity already in the zinc enzyme. But um, Haslauskas and his group, um, they started to replace the zinc um, on the one hand to manganese, and they could show some peroxidase activity, but they also could show some epoxidation of alkanes um, when the zinc, um, zinc is exchanged to manganese. And they, again, found some trace amounts of the alkane cleavage reaction, but not only trace amounts. So for in their case, the epoxidation was more prominent than the alkane cleavage. And they also exchanged the zinc um, to rhodium. And then they got um, hydroxygenation reaction or the also a hydroformulation. And what they observed with rhodium was that they got a lot of overloading and they solved this by masking and exchanging histidines and also lysines on the protein surface where the overloading happens. And um, a good example where many things were done were hemoenzymes. So on the un one hand, um, again, just the metal in the porphyrin ring was exchanged. But also the porphyrin was exchanged to fully synthetic cofactors. Also, the active site was modified without touching the porphyrin ring. Then there is also an example um, where the porphyrin ring was introduced in a protein which was not really a porphyrin containing enzyme before. And also an additional um, non-heme binding site was um, added to one, um, I think it was myoglobin. Um, yeah, so the exchange um, of, of the iron in the porphyrin of myoglobin um, um, resulted in more active enzymes because, I mean, iron is, is not the most active, uh, has not the highest reactivity in, in many reactions. And so for many reactions, um, iron is not active enough. And so the group of Hartwig, they decided to, um, so they first developed an expression system where they could um, express the myoglobin without porphyrin and then added porphyrins with different metals incorporated and tested them um, for a CH insertion here in this reaction or also cyclopropanation. And they found that mainly um, proteins which had the iridium incorporated in the porphyrin catalyzed the reaction while the iron um, enzyme always was completely inactive. And they then did some site saturation mutagenesis, combined the hit, and in the end really ended up with 97% um, activity while the iron enzyme is still in inactive. Mm, another group, um, they incorporated um, a manganese or a chromium saline complex instead of the um, porphyrin in the myoglobin. And so one group um, did that non-covalently just by interaction uh, with amino acids and some um, did it covalently by changing the two residues to cysteines, which then bound with the um, ligands. And in both cases, they could show peroxidase, uh, uh, sorry, oxidation of thioanisole, which is nice, but is not really something so special because also our tupin, which can do the oxidative reaction, can catalyze this reaction, but it's not selectively, and also here the selectivity is not exactly very, very good. But still, it's it's already a proof of principle. And yeah, one of the very famous examples of now the last years is the um, engineering of C450 enzymes of Francis Arnold's group, 
and I mean, P450 enzymes are used for many purposes. They are engineered since many years for many purposes, and they catalyze various oxidative reactions. And yeah, because of that, there are many variants already available. And um, they were reasoning about the reaction mechanism here and the octane transfer, and they were thinking maybe um, substrates, um, for example, with carbene precursors might follow a similar reaction mechanism. And they used um, a set of variants which were already available, and also, I think, a set of P450s and tested them in, in um, this reaction to the cyclopropanation of olefin. And they found um, that some of the variants and some of the um, P450s catalyze it to some extent. And in the end, they started um, to engineer these enzymes further and they ended up with quite nice reactivities. And used basically again some of the new variants and some of the old variants also in the same story by basically looking um, if you cannot just use carbanes but also nitrinoids um, instead of the um, oxanes and they could also catalyze this reaction basically uh, the CH amination and they continued doing this testing and engineering um, for quite some time now. And you can see this is the broad range of reactions. Means in the meantime that um, they are able to catalyze um, with um, P450s and these, the most of them or all of them are uh, non-natural reactions. And so although the metal center is not touched and it was basically just an engineering of the active site, when you then catalyze um, non-natural reaction is also sort of artificial. I mean, it's not the enzyme itself, which is artificial, but in that case, then the reaction. And yeah, also, of course, computational approaches are used for um, redesigning um, active sites, like the Rosetta approach by the Baker group. Of course, this is also applied to metal proteins. For example, here for this zinc containing adenosine deaminase, um, where they could um, get some activity which was further optimized by directed evolution for the hydrolysis um, of this nerve agent um, cyclosterin. And yeah. Also, in combination with the design approach, was this so from Ward and his group, they used the uh, metal in the carbonic anhydrase actually as anchor for their iridium cyanostool cofactor. And they got artificial transfer hydrogenase. And the first, their wild, let's say, wild type construct was not incredibly active. And again, they used the Rosetta design approach um, and protein engineering to improve um, the binding of, of this cyanostool. Um, cofactor and also the activity in this um, hydrogenase transfer reaction. And yeah, of course, you can completely create new binding sites um, in an existing active site or in any cavity or group of a protein, basically. And yeah, you introduce that by mutagenesis. You can also introduce non-natural amino acids because some are nicely binding um, metals or you can do chemical modifications in the protein. And yeah, one is the myoglobin, which I mentioned before. So that's the Lou group that works on myoglobin also. Um, and they were introducing a metal binding site, an additional metal binding site next to the bound porphyrin ring, and they um, wanted to mimic the nitric oxide reductase and were successful also. And yeah, another example that's also a quite old example, one of the first examples by the Rechkov where um, two histidis, histidine residues were introduced in a thermostable protein, um, which was then able to bind copper 
and that enzyme was able to catalyze the Dios Alda cyclo addition. And also, the same reaction was also um, used as proof of principle for yet another strategy by the Karma Group um, that used it introduced a cysteine in the um, by cytotoxic mutagenesis in a protein, um, which then could covalently bind malleate containing nitrogen donor ligands. And um, yeah, here is also the structure and the cysteine. And again, they could um, show Dios Alda cyclo addition reactivity in the protein. And yeah, the most famous um, by example for metal proteins without any covalence binding is the biotin stratavidin technology, which I guess you all know. And I will also just shortly touch it. Um, so biotin has a high affinity for herpavidin and met a metal can be linked via a spacer to the biotin. And yeah, you can use different metals there and also the spacer was varied. And also the streptavidin was engineered to even better bind the biotin. So that's the basic system, which is mainly done by Tom Ward, but at the beginning also by the Rest group. And yeah, many different reactions are catalyzed. I guess this list is not even complete because they are publishing also a lot and they are also using a lot of different metals. And also they have some cases where they even bind the metal directly to the streptavidin. And in many cases now also, when the first uh, reaction is discovered, the protein is further or yeah, is further engineered also to improve for the specific reactions that are found. So not just engineering for the binding of the biotin, but then also engin engineering for the specific reaction of interest. Yeah. So, and then I also said that in some cases you could introduce porphyrins in other scaffolds. So that was, for example, done in monoclonal antibodies where you then got um, oxidative activities or also in, could be uh, incorporated in a, in a silanase. Um, again, the oxidation of the thioanisole was used as proof of principle and here also you can see that also um, my manganese three complexes, either as porphyrin or as tannin, were incorporated in the silanase, and epoxidase activity could be observed. So yeah, there, as you can can see, there is always almost in every new slide there is a different name of a group there, because yeah, lately there are many groups working on that. Now, just very quickly, I mentioned before, unnatural amino acids can be used to bind the metals. And so that was one of the first approaches where successfully um, these amino acids were introduced and the metal were binding, but at the beginning there was no activity in this first computational design. Another example is, for example, um, also the um, metal binding in copper, Azurines, which was um, uh, where the selenocysteines and methionines were actually used to study the metal binding itself, not for the activity. And there is also a successful example using um, unnatural amino acids for metal binding and activity, which was published just this year, I think, um, where again the same amino acid, this C pyridyl alanine, alanine was used to bind the copper. And in this case, we could um, show Riddle Crafts reaction between a microacceptor and the indole. And after protein engineering, they got up to 94% conversion and quite a good PE. And yeah, as now just two more slides. Um, of course, like every protein, you could go for a completely de novo design also for metalloproteins, which means you completely construct the protein from scratch and then introduce also the metal binding site. Especially then, um, usually it works with alpha helix bundles, like you can see several examples. And 
yeah, so some reactivities were already observed, like hydrolase activity, peroxidase activity, or also nitrate redoxase activity. So, yeah, and again, oxidase activity, and it's mainly these two groups that do the de novo design of, of metal proteins. And yeah, so this is basically also the end of my presentation. Um, yeah, conclusion of this part is artificial metalloenzymes are really an exciting field of research and many groups are starting to work on that now. It might open ways for new reactions which are not catalyzed by natural reactions. But at the moment, um, most of these approaches are really just in the proof of principle state. And in many cases, it's always the same um, reactions that are used. Um, so the challenge will be really to go for more interesting and more relevant um, reactions, also to be more interesting than for application on, on industrial scale. Yeah, thanks. So. Questions? Yeah, just a general one. I was wondering if they could go in the structure when they change the metal detector, they could change the amino acid that binds it as they were with the like in some cases you yeah, so they kind of like change the material or something like that. Yeah. So in some cases, you, you see changes also in the structure. But in many cases, this really X-ray crystallography is not the method of choice. So if you have a smaller protein, it's there better to have a more dynamic method like NMR or also go for EPR if you have some um, paramagnetic ion there, because there you see more the, the flexibility, because a protein structure quite often is a rigid thing which is really done there at the moment. And you were talking about the system that was um, So we figured out that actually some of the amino acids are in fact oxidized. And so we just exchange them to amino acids which cannot be oxidized. So like histidines are oxidized, methi methionines, cysteines, we remove them, basically. And they change them by the production? Yeah, so we, we made, um, so we incubated samples with peroxide and without peroxide and send it for mass spec. And yeah, then we saw the differences. That's very, very much depending on the enzyme. So for the HNL, the leaching is not a problem at all. So it's binding very, very tightly, especially the variants. There it's very difficult to get rid of the metal. And on the other hand, the other coupling, for example, um, there the metal is removed very, very easily. And during extended purification, we lose the metal. And we always have to add it also to the reaction there. It depends really on the metal binding site. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. I mean, yeah. I mean, now we add it during the expression and we don't purify it. Huh? No, it doesn't matter. So we, we compared structure with metal, without metal, EP, um, um, CD spectra ex from expression with metal, without metal, there was no difference. So what you're saying that in many cases you don't, if, if it works and you don't need it completely pure, you can use it directly as healthy lysate. Mm -hmm. And in some proteins, it is easier to incorporate the metal already during expression. Yeah. Because for some proteins, it's more difficult to get it in the active site after. after 
And there are also some proteins, not the groupins, which need actually some kind of metal there for correct coding. That is true, but not for the groupins. Yeah. Um, for the groupins, because we have this high expression, we use, we use E. coli, but here in the house, Pichia is used a lot. And also metal proteins were already expressed in Pichia also here in, in the house. There are no further questions. I guess we have a break and then <laughs> I think it's four or yeah, before we continue anyway. Yeah. Okay. <laughs>